Welcome to Just Grace It, a production of Grace Life Bible Church dedicated to teaching and establishing believers in the principles of the Grace Life. Let's join Pastor Brian Ross, rightly dividing the word and discussing grace through faith. Luke chapter 9, verse 1. Then he called his twelve disciples together and gave them power and authority over all devils and to cure diseases. And he sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. And he said unto them, Take nothing for your journey, neither staves nor scrip, neither bread, neither money, neither have two coats apiece. And whatsoever house ye enter into, there abide, and thence depart. Verse 5, And whosoever will not receive you when you go into that city, shake off the dust from, from your feet for a testimony against them. Now look at verse 6. And they departed and went through the towns, preaching what? The gospel and healing where? Everywhere. Now come with me. Same chapter. Drop down to verse 43. So, we learn in verse 6 that they preached the gospel where? Everywhere. Okay? Everywhere they went. And, uh, but they did, not, they did not yet know or understand about the fact that Christ was going to have to die. Now look at verse, look at verse uh, 43. And they were all amazed at the mighty power of God, but while they wondered every one at all these things which Jesus did, He said unto His disciples, let these sayings sink down into your ears. I like that. Sink down into your ears. In other words, pay attention. The Son of Man shall be delivered into the hands of men. Notice, but they understood not this saying. And it was hid from them. They perceived it not, and they feared to ask him of that saying. Now, is there more detail there in verse 45 than you got in Mark chapter 9? Now we learn that not only it says that they understood not the saying, but now we know that it was what? It was hid from them, and they perceived it what? Not. And that they were too afraid to ask him. Now, here's my point. Did verse 6 tell you that they went everywhere preaching the gospel? But now verses 44 and 45 of the same chapter said that not only did they not understand about His death and resurrection, but that it was hid from them and they perceived it not. Now, what do I know then? What were they preaching back in verse 6? Were they preaching the death, burial, and resurrection? There is no way that they were preaching that. Because when they're told that later on, it says it explicitly says that they understood it not, that it was hid from them, and they what? Perceived it not. We need to be careful, folks, when we talk about the Gospel. There is more than one Gospel in the Bible. Okay? There is more than one set of good news. There is more than one message that God has delivered to mankind at different points of time. I could go right now and preach the gospel of the kingdom, and nobody could get saved from hearing that message. Because now the gospel is not the kingdom of God is the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, repent you and believe the gospel. Now the gospel is Christ died for your sins, was buried, and what? See, we stake our faith today on things that these men could not perceive, understand, or know. Therefore, they were not teaching here the same thing that Paul was teaching later on. Now, that's not hard to figure out, right? All you've got to do is be able to read and use some common sense when you read to be able to perceive that what's going on there is not the same thing that Paul's preaching now. Paul glories in the cross of Christ, right? Paul, said, Paul talks about the preaching of the cross is to them that perish, what? Foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it's what? The power of God. The power of God today to save the sinner is found in the preaching of the cross. Come with me back to Mark chapter 9. I was speaking to somebody recently. He was asking me about a loved one or, or, or somebody in their, in their family who is, who is sick and they're not sure that they've ever trusted Christ. It seems to the world often 
that it is close-minded, possibly arrogant, to say that there's no salvation outside of Jesus Christ. But that's what the Word of God says. The war- Jesus says, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. The Apostle Paul writes in 1 Timothy, he, he writes to Timothy and he says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man who? Christ Jesus. There is no salvation today outside of Jesus Christ. Now, and even when I say that, we have to be careful and we have to be clear. When I say there is no salvation outside of Jesus Christ, it is not enough to just believe that Jesus Christ lived and walked on planet Earth. An atheist believes that. Okay? It's not enough just to believe that Jesus was an objective man of history. That's not enough. A non-believer can believe that and acknowledge that. The, The secular history books record that there was a person that walked the Earth named Jesus of Nazareth. When we talk about trusting in Christ, we're talking about specific things about Christ. We're talk, come with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We're talking about the fact that we... See, what we have to believe today for our salvation is exactly the things that those men there did not understand. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, look with me at verse 4. He says, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, now, how that Christ died for our what? Why did Christ die? Christ died for our what? Sins. That's why he died. Notice what else it says. According to the Scripture. And that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to what? See, what you and I need to do, we need to understand, number one, that we're a sinner, okay? Number two, that Christ died for our sins. And number three, that he rose again. Right? Now, when we believe that and that alone, Not church attendance, not how good we were, not how much money we put in the offering plate, not any other thing that we would bring in our little red wagon of goodies to God and say, look at all the good things I did. We don't trust any of that stuff. We rely exclusively on who? On Christ and His work for us on the cross and His resurrection from the dead. When that message and that message alone is believed, the sinner passes from death to life. Okay? That is what the lost need to know, folks. And last Sunday when I was talking about the church growth and evangelism and how the church is only going to grow to the extent and to the degree that we're willing to share the message of Jesus Christ with other people, the lives of our family, the lives of our friends, the lives of the people that we know hang in the balance of eternity. I would hate to know that somebody that is lying on their deathbed without an opportunity to hear anymore didn't get that opportunity because I didn't share it with them. This is eternity that we're dealing with. Come back with me to Mark chapter 9. These men did not get, understand, or perceive the very contents of the thing that Paul preached for our salvation. Because it was a different time. It was a different dispensation that was in effect. There was a different message that God was communicating to mankind. And we studied over and over and over again in our study in Mark that Jesus Christ was not sent but to the lost sheep of the house of who? Israel. And the message, the gospel, the preaching of the gospel of the kingdom is specific to the group of people that he was dealing with at the time. Okay. Now come with me if you would look at verse 30. Well, I guess we're not done with that. This is what, what I miss out on if I don't have my notes. Come back with me to Matthew 17. Come back with me to Matthew 17. Matthew chapter 17, look at verse 22. Matthew chapter 17, verse 22, it says here, And while... They abode in Galilee. Jesus said unto them, The Son of Man shall be betrayed into the hands of men. And they shall kill Him. And the third day He shall be raised again. Notice, and they were exceedingly happy. What's it say? 
Folks, not only did they not perceive, not only did they not understand, not only was it hid from them, but they heard that and they were like, oh. When you hear that, what's your reaction? Your reaction ought to be, praise the Lord, hallelujah, Christ died for my sin. These guys here that are like, are you kidding me? You're going to go off on that again? You're going to talk about that again? Well, we don't have time to do it, but nine times. In the book of Matthew, Jesus foretells his own death. And not a single time that he did that did those men ever understand it while he was still alive. It is not until after his death, after his resurrection, and during his 40-day post-resurrection ministry that those men ever understood anything about his death, burial, and resurrection. We've studied that in detail. Okay, I don't want to labor that any more than we already have. Come with me back to Mark chapter 9. These men, my point is this, these men are not rejoicing in, 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 the, in the news that Christ is going to go die on the cross. They're not rejoicing in the fact that he's going to die, be buried, and rise again. They don't even understand it, and they're sorry, they're upset, it bothers them when they hear that. Mark chapter 9, verse 33. And he came to Capernaum. And being in the house, he asked them, What was it that, that, that ye disputed among yourselves by the way? And they held their peace, for by the way they had disputed among themselves who should be what? This, this kind of makes me laugh just a little bit. okay? Because they just... You just read about how he tells them that he's going to die, be killed and, and, and rise again the third day and so on. And they don't, they don't get it. They don't understand it. They don't perceive it. They're sorry about it. And then while, you know, ten minutes later, they're walking down the road to Capernaum and they're sitting there fighting amongst themselves over who the greatest one of them is. I mean, isn't that human nature? Okay? So Jesus asked them now in verse 33, he says, and, and he came to Capernaum and being in the house, he asked them, what was it? What was it that ye disputed among yourselves by the way? Verse 34, But they held their peace. For by the way they had disputed among themselves who should be the greatest. Um, are they embarrassed? He says, what are you guys talking about? They said, like, ah, well, um, you know, nothing. But being the Lord, does he know the whole time what they were talking about? Okay. No, so you look, at verse, you look at verse 35 then. Look at verse 35. He says, And he sat down and called the twelve, and saith unto them, If any man desire to be first, the same shall be last of all, and servant of all. I got a, I got a funny story about this, just real quick. My kids, my boys, they argue all the time about who's going to be the first one out the back door. Literally, they're standing at the back door fighting over, it's my turn, you know, doing all that stuff, right? So I said to Andrew one time, I said, Andrew, don't you know that the first shall be last? And he looks at me, and he's like, what does that mean? I'm like, it means that the first shall be last. So the next time, they're arguing, Daniel's in the front, and he wants to be first, and Andrew says to him, don't you know the first shall be last? But he, he says there, and he sat down, at verse 35, and he sat down and called the twelve and said to them, if any man desire to be what? First. Hey, let's face it right off the bat. Is it human nature to want to be the best? To want to be number one? To want to be the one that's on the top, the top dog, have top billing? To be the one that everybody is wanting, wanting to see and, 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 and giving all that praise and adulation, all that stuff to you? Is it human nature to want to be number one, to be the first? Okay? He says, he says, if any man shall desire to be what? First, the same shall be last of all. And servant what? Of all. Now, come with me if you would to Matthew chapter 19. Come into Matthew chapter 19. It's human nature, folks, to want to be the best. You know, pride... Pride is a, a, an interesting thing, isn't it? What's the, middle, what's the middle letter of the word pride? I. What's the middle letter of the word sin? Hmm. Now, 
What led to the what led to the first sin? Lucifer was lifted up because of his what? Pride. Right? Pride is pride is an interesting thing in and of itself because I would I would submit to you that there's a little bit of human ego and pride that's what get you out of bed every morning. Right? That, that, that drives you to spend, you know, I don't know, depending on the person, anywhere between, you know, 20 minutes and an hour and a half getting ready to come to church. Because you want people, you want to put out, you know, your best impression, right? Okay? So there's, a, there's something about pride that, is, that, that sort of drives us and motivates us to do things in our life. But if you take pride to the excess, does pride cause a lot of trouble and a lot of conflict and a lot of grief? Okay? These guys are arguing and disputing over who's going to be what? The greatest. Who's going to be first? Who's going to be the best? And he says to them, those who desire to be first, they shall be made what? Last of all. Look at, look at Matthew chapter uh, 7, I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 19, verse, um, verse 27. Then Peter, then answered Peter and said unto him, this is, we're kind of jumping in the middle here, but we'll, it's fine for now. Behold, we have forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we have therefore? And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, ye, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. What are the apostles going to get from having followed Christ? They're going to sit on 12 what? Thrones, and they're going to be the judges over the 12 tribes of who? Of Israel. Okay? Verse 29. And everyone, here it is, and everyone that hath forsaken houses, or brethren, or sisters, or fathers, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my name's sake, shall receive an hundredfold, and shall inherit what? In everlasting life. So, now, now look at verse 30. But many that are what? First shall be what? Last. And the last shall be what? Now when you judge, when we talk about, in my world history class, we talk all the time, when we, when we start studying a new time period or a new, uh, a new era of history, one of the things we always do is we talk about what is the social structure. You've seen these things before, right? A pyramid, right? So at the top you have, you know, let's just take Middle Ages Europe, okay? At the top you have the Pope. Then you have the kings and queens. Then you have the nobles. Then you have the knights. And then you have the peasants and stuff on the bottom, right? Well, what is that pyramid telling you? It's telling you how the society is organized socially, right? But it's also, it's not just doing that, it's telling you where the power within that society rests, right? At the top of that society, with the, in the Middle Ages, it was the Pope. It was the head of the Catholic Church. And the guy at the bottom, the little peon, the peasant at the bottom, the serf, that was tied to the land and could never go more than 30 miles away from the manor, did he have any power? No. It's the people with the houses, the lands, the ones that have accumulated the wealth that we typically look at and say, these are the guys that are where? On the top. Right? Well, he's telling them there that they have to sell all that stuff, that they have to get rid of all that stuff. And then he ends the passage in verse 30 by saying, but many that are what? So there are people that were alive right then that you would look at and you would say, these guys are what? First. He says, but many that are first shall be what? See, they're not last now, now they're first, but they shall be made what? Last. And the guy that's down here that's last, that's at the bottom of the heap, it says, he shall be what? First. See, in the economics of the kingdom of God, there's going to be a total 180 reversal. That's what he's talking about. Okay? In the economics, when the kingdom of God is established, when they prepare for it to be ushered in here, as they're doing, the kingdom is at hand. We've talked about that, right? He's talking to them about what they're going to be required to do. And in the context, he's talking to the rich young ruler, and he tells him to sell all that what? He has. And what was the rich young ruler's response? Oh, thank you, praise the Lord, I'm just going to go sell all my stuff so I can get into heaven. Is that his response? The Bible says that he went away what? 
sorrowful because he had much wealth. See, he couldn't handle the teaching there because the teaching would have taken somebody that was on the top and made him what? Last. And what is it, come back with me now, come back with me to Mark chapter 9, what is it that these guys are fighting about? They're fighting about who's going to be what? Greatest. Mark chapter 9. Verse 35. And he sat down and called the twelve and said, saith unto them, If any man desire to be first. See, so if you desire that, and you follow that desire through, you follow through on that desire, the same shall be what? Last of all. And not only that, shall be what? Servant of all. And the economics of the kingdom of God is going to be a switching. There's going to be a reordering. There's going to be a, the people are, are expected that they're going to have to sell all that they have. Okay? But I need to say, is this you and I here? Is this the church, the body of Christ back here? No. This is the nation of Israel. This is Israel's instruction in, prepa in preparation for the establishment of her kingdom. Okay? Now look with me at verse 36. Therefore Jesus warns them, I should say, before we move on, warns them in Mark chapter 9, verse 35, not to allow the desire for preeminence to rob them of the riches of future blessing. Christ then illustrates his point now in verse 36, by talking about the children. Look at, look at verse 36. He says, um, it says here, and he took a child and set him in the midst of them. And when he had taken him in his arms, he said unto them, verse 37, whosoever shall receive one of such children in my name receiveth me. And whosoever shall receive, whosoever shall receive me, receiveth not me, but him that what sent me. Um, to, to make the point, Jesus he, he, he brings in a child and he sets a child in their midst, and Jesus embraces the child. And as he does, he tells them that that whosoever is going to receive the child will receive who receive him. Hold your hand there and come with me to Matthew 18, if you will. Come back to Matthew 18. verse 1. Matthew chapter 18. Oh, I should have told you that the number in parentheses is the page number. Sorry about that. If you're using the Bible provided by the church. Matthew chapter 18, look at verse 1. At the same, and at the same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called a little child unto him and set him in the midst of them and said, Verily I say unto you, Except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. You ever notice how children have a very uncomplicated way of looking at things? I notice that a lot with my kids, and I'm noticing that as my older boy is aging and getting older, not that the other one isn't, you understand, but that at six, his view of things is very different than the three-year-old's. The three-year-old is just like, you know, whatever, you know, la-di-da. And the six-year-old now is now starting to ask why this and why that and how come. And, and, and he wants to know and understand, whereas a little, little child just accepts whatever you tell him and is like, okay, daddy, whatever, you know. And it's like just, just happy and that's just, that's just it. That's just the end of the story, end of the discussion. But then they get older and they start to know what? Why? Why is it this way? Um, I, how many have ever, you ever heard of the, uh, the cartoon Liberty's Kids? Maybe some of you have heard about that. It's a, it's a Revolutionary War cartoon that takes kids through the history of the American Revolution. Well, my son, my older son, we found it on Netflix, and I said, here, you've got to watch this. So he's watching this cartoon, and I go out, I go out in the, the, the yard the other day, and he's George Washington, and he's making my younger one be Cornwallis, and he says to him, 
I just defeated you. You need to go in jail. You know, all this, he's making this whole thing up. But now he's asking me a million questions about the Revolutionary War. Who was president in the 1400s? And who was president in the 1200s? And he wants to know all this stuff. Well, when you have a real little child, there's an innocency there that they just accept things for what they are and they just go with it, right? And here's Christ, look at verse 3, and he said, Verily I send you, except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of God. Whosoever therefore, here it is, shall what? Humble himself. What are they arguing about? Who's the greatest? When they're arguing about who's the greatest, are they exalting themselves or are they humbling themselves? They're exalting themselves. Verse 4, Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest where? You see how that works? The one, that's, the one that's the humblest, the meekest, the most seemingly insignificant is the one who from the point of view of God is going to be the what? The greatest. Verse 5, And whoso shall receive one such child in my name receiveth who? Me. For whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck that he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Woo. That's strong language, isn't it? Come with me look at Luke chapter 9. Come over to Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9, look with me, verse 46. Luke chapter 9, verse 46, Then there arose a reasoning among them, which of them should be greatest? And Jesus, perceiving the thought of their heart, took a child and set him by them, and saith unto them, and said unto them, Whosoever shall receive this child in my name receiveth me, and whosoever shall receiveth me receiveth him that sent me. For he that is least among you all, the same shall be what? You know what this kind of reminds me of? This kind of reminds me of 1 Corinthians chapter 12 where Paul talks about the body of Christ and he talks about how, you know, if the, that the comely parts are more what? Necessary? The parts that you look at and you say, ah, well, you know, maybe we could do without that or without this or what have you, but the way God looks at it, he goes, those parts are what? They're necessary. And he says very plainly at the end of verse 48, read it again, end of verse 48, for he that is least among you all the same shall be what? Great. By taking the little child in his arms, Jesus proceeded to give them a lesson on humility, is what he's doing. The disciples had been judging greatness, no doubt, on such qualities as strength, courage, oratory, knowledge, and wisdom. They had to learn from this little child, which had none of these qualities, that greatness in God's sight consists in, humble, in the humbleness of an infant. Helpless in itself and totally dependent upon its parents for sustenance. This issue of pride. Come with me very quickly. Look at two verses with me. Come back to Proverbs chapter 16. Proverbs chapter 16, if you would. Look at verse 18. The issue in that story, the reason why Christ brings in the child is to make a point to these guys about humility. That's why he says there in, Mark, in, in, in Matthew that you need to humble yourself as a child. Proverbs chapter 16, look with me if you would at verse 18. It says, Pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. Better it is to be of an humble spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoil with who? The proud. Do the proud sometimes win? Yeah, they do. But from the eyes of the way God looks at it, look at, look at verse 19 again. Better it is to be of a humble spirit with the who? 
See, it's, it's, you know what? It's better to be where. It's better to be on the bottom sometimes. It's better to be last. Is what the Bible's saying. If, if being on top is going to require you, if being the greatest is going to require you to function out of a proud, haughty, arrogant spirit, the Word of God says it's better to be where? On the bottom. It's better to be last than first. It's better to be humble rather than great. Verse, verse 19, Better it is to be of a humble spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoil with who? The proud. Come with me to Micah chapter 6. Micah chapter 6. Yes, we have a Micah sighting. Come to Micah chapter 6. It's after Jonah. Come with Micah chapter 6. Look with me at verse 8. Micah chapter 6, verse 8. Verse 8, it says, He has showed thee, O man, what is good. And what doth the Lord require of thee? To do justly, and to love mercy, and to walk how? Humbly with thy God. When these guys are sitting there arguing and disputing amongst themselves over who is the greatest, are they functioning out of pride and arrogance or out of humility? They're functioning out of pride and arrogance. Now who's the ultimate picture of humility? It's Christ Himself. Come with me to Philippians chapter 2. See, who's ultimately going to be the greatest in the kingdom? Who's going to be the greatest? It's going to be Christ Himself. It's not going to be Peter, James, John, or any one of the other boys. It's going to be Christ. Okay? It's going to be the Lord Jesus Christ. Philippians chapter 2, look with me at verse 6. Well, verse 5, it says, Let this mind be in you which was also where? In Christ Jesus. Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to me, made equal with who? Was Jesus Christ in eternity past, the end of, was He co-equal and God Himself? Yes. Was He as high as you could get? Was He as great as you could get? He is God, co-equal with God the Father. He says, verse 6, Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be made equal with God. Look at verse 7. But made Himself of what? No reputation, and took upon Him the form of a what? Servant. Here is Christ doing exactly what He's teaching those guys back there to do. He's great. There's no greater position that He had. Yet, He did what? He humbled Himself. He left that position for a time to take upon Himself human flesh. The form of a servant, it says, verse 7. And took upon Him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of who? Men. Look at verse 8. And being found in fashion as a man, He humbled Himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of what? So here He is. He is God the Father. He, I'm sorry, God the Son, co-equal with God the Father. And He takes upon Himself the form of a servant. He's incarnated in the womb of the Virgin Mary. And He comes to earth, and He lives, and He goes to the cross, and He what? Dies. And here you have God. You have the death of God the Son. And three days later, he what? Verse 9, wherefore? So because, because of verse 8, because he was found in fashion as a man, and because he humbled himself, and because he came obedient unto death, verse 9 says, wherefore also God hath what? Highly what? So he was at the top, he came down to the bottom, he did the work of a servant, and now he's exalted back where? Verse 9, Wherefore God hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above what? Every name. That at the name of Jesus every knee should bow. Of things in heaven and things in earth and things where? Can I tell you right now, if you're sitting here this morning and you've never trusted Jesus Christ, 
If you've never relied exclusively on Christ's shed blood and His resurrection from the dead as the only payment for your sin, you will one day bow the knee. Better to decide to do it now out of your own free will and volition than do it later against your will. Isn't that better to decide now? Isn't it better to not let another day, another second, another minute go by without knowing that Christ has forgiven you of all your sins? He was exalted. See, there's a, hum there's a humility. He was in the form of God in verse 6. In verse 7, He made Himself of no reputation and came in the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. In verse 8, He was found in fashion and He humbled Himself and became obedient unto the death of the cross. And as a result, in verse 9 and 10, He's highly what? Exalted. Jesus Christ Himself is going to be first and the greatest in the kingdom. Because He is the ultimate picture of the humility that He's speaking about back there in the Gospels. He did it Himself. Now look with me if you would back up a few verses. Look at verse five. Look at verse three. What about you and I? Verse one. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels of mercies, look what Paul says here. Fulfill ye my joy that ye be one. When Paul looked at the Philippians. What would have brought more, heart, more joy to the heart of Paul? What would have brought joy to the heart of Paul when he looked at the Philippians? He says there, he says there in the verse, verse 2, Fulfill ye my joy that ye be what? What brought joy to the heart of Paul? It was when the believers were like what? Minded. Read the rest of the verse. That ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of what? One mind. Verse 3, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than what? Uh-oh. Do we sometimes think about ourselves more highly than we ought to think? Do we sometimes listen to other people preach or other people sing or other people do this, that, or the other thing and say, I could do it better than them. Why is he doing it that way? Why is she doing this? Why, why this? Why that? Why, why blah, 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 blah. See, what's it say here? Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other what? See, there's a, there's a practical point here about humility for you and I in the dispensation of grace. We are to be like-minded in verse 2. We are to have the same love of one accord of one mind to the degree that we, don't, that, that we function with a lowliness of mind in verse 3 and, not a, and, and, a, and esteem others as better than who? Ourselves. Verse 4, Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of what? Others. Now, what is the great illustration then that Paul uses for that type of humility of mind? This is a passage we just read about who? Christ. Christ had it all. And you just think, the Son of God became one of the sons of men. So that the sons of men might become the sons of God. He left it. He gave it up to come down in the form of a servant. And when Paul speaks to the body of Christ here about humility of mind, when he talks about loneliness of mind, when he talks about esteeming others better than themselves, imagine, if you would, if Christ was up there in, in, in eternity and glory one day and He goes, you know... I just think I'm better than Brian. And I don't think that I want to be made in the likeness of men. We'd be in trouble. I'd be in trouble. You'd be in trouble. We'd all be in trouble. The next time, folks, that we are tempted to think about ourselves more highly than we ought to think, we need to remember 
what Christ did for us. That's the point. Come with me to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, look at verse 3. For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think how? Soberly, according as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. See, there's an instruction here for us not to think of ourselves as what? High. Great. Come to Galatians 3, last verse on this point. Come to Galatians 3. I'm sorry, Galatians 6, verse 3. Galatians chapter 6. Verse 2. Bear ye one another's burdens. And so fulfill the law of Christ. Look at verse 3. If a man think himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceiveth who? Himself. Come back with me if you would to Mark chapter 9. See folks, there's lessons here that apply to you and I just as much as they apply to these men back here. I don't know a single person alive that has never struggled with pride. Right? And you even, you even meet the person who says, I'm just so humble. I'm just so humble. And I'm proud of it. Okay? We need to be aware of these things in our own lives. Look, at ver- look with me at verse 38. Mark 9, verse 38, last section. And Jesus and John answering him. Now, this is interesting. In verse 38, John chimes in now. And John answering him saying, Master, we saw one casting out devils in thy name, and he followeth not after he followeth not us. And we forbade him because he followeth not us. Now, in other words, they run into a guy who's casting out devils in the name of Christ, but he's not doing what? He's not going along with them, following them everywhere they're going. Okay? Now, I want you to tie some things together here in the verse. Look with me at verse 37. Whosoever shall receive one of such children in my what? Name. Receiveth me. Look at verse 38. And John answering him, saying, Master, we saw one casting out devils in thy what? Name. So they run into this guy who's casting out devils in the name of Christ that is not following after. It's clear to me as I studied the passage that is is John's conscience pricked to a degree after hearing what Christ said in verse 37. Okay, so he says, wait a minute, what about this guy? Master, we saw this guy, he was casting out devils in thy name and so on, but he's not following after us, so we forbade him. We, we said, you can't do that, because he followeth not us. Verse 39. Verse 39. But Jesus said, forbid him not. For there is no man... Which shall do miracle, which shall do a miracle in my name, that can lightly speak evil of me. For he that is not against us is on what? Our part. Christ's answer is very direct. He says, Don't forbid a man from doing miracles in my name, is essentially what he's saying. The reasoning Christ gives is that because there is no man that can do miracles in his name and speak evil of Christ at the same time. Now, I want you to hold your hand there and come with me to Matthew 7. This, is a seem- this seemingly contradicts something else he's, he says in a different area. Come with me to Matthew 7. And look with me at verse 22. 
Matthew 7, verse 22. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, we have, not proph- uh, have we not prophesied in thy name? And have we cast out devils? In, in thy name cast out devils? And in, thy name, and in thy name done wonderful works? And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work what? Now this is interesting because here, there's some people that he's clearly, they're, they're clearly doing things in the name of Christ, but they never what? Knew him, and does he forbid him from doing it? Look, verse, verse 23, and, and, uh, verse 23, Then I will profess unto them, I never walk. Knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. But then in Mark chapter 9, the, John asks them about this guy that they forbid to cast out evil spirits in, in his name, and he says, don't forbid him to walk. To do it. Now, it's, it seems, there seems to be a, a contradiction here to what Christ just said in Mark chapter 9. But here, to me, is the key. Only the Lord knows what is in the heart of a man. And apparently, the man whom the disciples had forbidden was, in fact, a true what? Believer. A few things about this. In my mind, the key is verse 40. Come back with me to Mark. The key is verse 40. Mark chapter 9, look at verse 40. He says, For he that is not against us is on our what? Part. To stand against what God is doing. See, the, the key, that's the key issue to me. You either stand w- with God and what he's doing or you stand what? Against him. Now, it's an interesting thing to consider. Come with me to Second Second Thessalonians chapter two. A lot of talk, folks, in our day about miracles. A lot of people claiming to do things in the name of Christ. Okay. All you got to do is turn into Christian TV and so forth, and you'll see your fair share of this type of thing. Just because somebody claims to do something in the name of Christ, does that make it legitimate? 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, look at verse 9. In verse 8 it says, And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan. Notice, with all power and what? Signs. And what? Can Satan do miracles, wonders, and signs? Yes. Okay? He can. Verse, verse, uh, verse 9. Satan with all power, uh, with all power and signs and lying wonders. Verse 10. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness. And then that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be what? Saved. So when the, when the end time comes, And the Antichrist is on earth. Is he going to do signs, wonders, and miracles and perform lying wonders with the goal of trying to deceive people on earth? Okay? Keep that in mind. Come with me now to Exodus. We're almost done. Come to Exodus chapter 7. We're almost done. Yeah, we don't have to be. I got a pocket full of cough drops. So as long as I got cough drops, we can keep going. Exodus chapter 7, look with me, verse 1. It says, And the Lord said unto Moses, See, I have made thee a god to Pharaoh, and Aaron thy brother shall be thy prophet. Verse 2, And they shall speak all that I command thee, and Aaron thy brother shall speak unto Pharaoh, and he sh- that he send the children of Israel out of his land. Look at verse 3. Notice, And I will harden Pharaoh's heart and multiply my what? Signs and my what? Wonders in the land of Egypt. Are there certain signs and certain wonders that belong to God? Drop down to verse 10. And Moses and Aaron went in unto Pharaoh. And they did as the Lord had commanded. And Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh and before his servants, and it became a what? Serpent. Now look at verse 11. 
And Pharaoh also called the wise men and the sorcerers and the magicians of Egypt, and they did in like manner with their what? Do you see in the passage that God has my signs and my wonders in verse 3, and that in verse 11, the sorcerers, magicians, and so forth have their enchantments that mimic and copy what God did? Drop down to verse 20, same chapter. And, and Moses and Aaron did as the Lord commanded and lifted up the rod and smote the waters. And there was in the river and in the sight of Pharaoh and in the sight of his servants, all the waters that were in the river were turned to what? And all the fish that was in the river died. <clears throat> Lost my spot. And the, and, and the river stank. And the Egyptians could, uh, could not drink of the water of the river. And there was blood throughout all the land of Egypt. Look at verse 22. And the magicians of Egypt did so with their one. Are you kidding me? There's already blood everywhere. And all they are able to do is do what? Copy. God smites the river, turns to what? What do they do? Real original. Right? Come in chapter 8, look at verse 6. And Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt, and the frogs came up and covered the land of Egypt. And the magicians did so with their enchantments and brought up frogs upon the land of Egypt. That's crazy! They already got frogs everywhere, and these clowns go out, and just to prove a point, they bring more frogs. What is the lesson here? The lesson here is two things. Number one, does God have His signs and His wonders? Is Satan able to produce lying wonders? And in the production of lying wonders, it seems from the Word of God that Satan is limited to only mimic what God has already what? Done. Come with me, if you would, to Deuteronomy chapter 13. Verse 1. If there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams and giveth thee a sign or a wonder. So some guy comes into Israel and he, he's got, I'm a prophet, you better listen to me. And he works a sign or a wonder. Verse 2. And the sign or the wonder, what? So is the guy a faker? No. Does the sign of the wonder actually happen? Verse 2, And the sign of the wonder come to pass, where, watch this, Wherefore he spake unto thee, saying, Let us go after other gods, which thou hast not known, and let us what? So the guy comes in, he works the wonder, he works the sign to get your attention. Then once he has your attention, he says, Hey, look at Baal over there, that looks pretty good. What did God say in His Word? I am the Lord thy God, and thou shalt have no other gods. What? What's Israel supposed to do? Verse 3, Thou shalt not hearken unto the voice of that prophet, or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God proveth you to know whether ye love the Lord your God with all your heart. Now here's the problem, folks. In the modern church, we have everybody racing after signs. Right? But even when the signs were in effect, God said, the way you know whether the person is in fact legitimate is that they are, what they're saying is in line with my word. Because here's an example of a guy who comes in, who works the wonder, works the sign, does it, and it comes to pass, but then he turns around and he tells Israel to follow other gods. What does God say to him? Don't want. Listen to that guy. Folks, we got all kinds of people today that are claiming signs, wonders, miraculous healings in the name of Jesus Christ, and they turn right around and tell you to go back under the law. 
They turn right around and tell you to put yourself back under a performance system. They tell you, they, they tell you to go follow the Sermon on the Mount as the, as the operating principles for how the believer is supposed to function today. And they do all of this stuff that is contrary. It's in the Bible. Is it in the Bible? It's all in the Bible. Whoop. That's not in my Bible anymore. It fell out. It's all scriptural. It's not what? It's not dispensational. Let's, go, let's close. On your way to Mark 9, stop at Matthew 24. Folks, you need to listen and trust God's written word. Not signs, not wonders, not miracles, not what happened to Aunt so-and-so or Uncle Joe 50 years ago and they told you about it, but God's written word. The only way that you know that you have a message from God is through an objective standard outside of yourself. It's the only way. Apart from that, I could come in here and I could tell you anything. I could swear up and down God told me. I could jump up and down. I could get real loud, real sweaty, even more loud and sweaty than I already am telling you about it. But if there's, if there's not a verse of Scripture from the rightly divided word that I'm basing it on, you don't have anything. You have opinion. You have emotion. But you don't have anything. You have to have an objective standard outside of yourself. I believe Christ. The reason I believe Christ died is because that book says so. Matthew 24, verse 24. Jesus warns, and there shall arise false Christ. And false prophets who shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very what? Signs and lying wonders. Come back and we'll close Mark chapter 9, verse 41. Mark chapter 9, verse 41. For whosoever shall give you a cup of water to drink in my name, because ye belong to Christ, verily I say unto you, he shall not lose his what? Reward. Anyone who legitimately offered the apostles help and assistance will be rewarded for having what? Done so. Why? Verse 40. For he that is not against us is on our what? Part. The only Father, we thank you once again for your word. We're grateful for the saints that have gathered here to hear your word preached. We pray that they would be edified for having come out. We pray that as we look forward to different events through the Bible on Seven Sundays, the church fellowship and uh, Christmas program and different things, that we'll be mindful of the fact that we have an ambassadorship, that we have a ministry to carry forth. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. You've been watching Just Grace It, a production of Grace Life Bible Church. Salvation is free. Put your faith in the shed blood of Christ as the only payment for your sins. If you are interested in joining a community of believers who rejoice in who God has made them in Jesus Christ, call or write to us or visit us online at justgraceit.com.